Okay, let's try this again. My phone camera fell off. My little MacGyver uh, kind of setup here last time. So let's just try this again. Okay, I'm going to try and tell you about the underlying polynomial algebra of cubic Hermit interpolation, also called osculatory interpolation, as the book says, that comes from the Latin word osculare, to kiss. We'll see how that works. But basically it's just a limiting kind of Lagrange interpolation. We have, uh, let's suppose we have four Lagrange nodes. So we have nodes at x equals, pardon me, theta equals zero, theta equals epsilon, theta equals one minus epsilon, and theta equals one. And so we'd have four function values at those uh, points, and that would give us enough information to fit a cubic uh, polynomial in theta to those things, because we have the zeroth coefficient, the first coefficient, the second coefficient, and the third coefficient of the cubic. That would give us the node polynomial theta times theta minus epsilon times theta minus 1 minus epsilon times theta minus 1, a degree 4 uh, node polynomial. That would be 0 at each of the nodes. If we take the limit as epsilon goes to 0, if we allow these nodes to squish together, and allow these ones to squish together, then we violate a condition of Lagrange nodes. Lagrange nodes have to be distinct. Um, and we're going to allow these things to squish exactly together. And once they've squashed together, then knowing the function value at this point, and the function value at this point is only two pieces of information. So somehow we've got to get those two pieces of information back, because this degree four node polynomial still needs four pieces of information to determine a cubic. So the trick is to realize that knowing the function value here and the function value here and the distance between allows you to deduce the difference quotient, the secant line, slope of the secant line between those two things. You get f at epsilon minus f at zero divided by epsilon, and that has a valid limit as epsilon goes to zero. So as that thing shrinks to zero, those two pieces of information, which we always know, will somehow tell us what the derivative is at the origin. So now we say, well, actually, for this node polynomial, what we want are the four pieces of information, the value of the function at zero, the value of the derivative at zero, those are the two there, the value of the function at one, and the value of the derivative of the function at one. So if we know those four pieces of information, we're still going to be able to determine a cubic. So the way this works is we're going to find uh, polynomials in theta that are like the Lagrange polynomials. So they're going to be 1 when we want to use one of these bits of information and 0 uh, at where all the other bits of information are provided. So let's define the following four cubic polynomials called G00, G01, G10, G11. And this is going to be useful for the function value at 0. G01 is going to be useful for the derivative g10 is going to be useful for the uh, value of the function at 1, and g11 is going to be the value for the derivative at 1. So let's look at this. Here's uh, the polynomial 2 theta plus 1 times theta minus 1 squared. The value of this polynomial at theta equals 0 is going to be 1 times minus 1 squared. It's just plus 1. So the value of the, the polynomial is 1 there. The value when theta equals 1 is going to be 0. And it's pretty clear that the value of the derivative at theta equals 1 is also going to be 0. So we're going to have the value is 1 here, and then it's 0 here, and it's flat out there. It's not so obvious that the value of the derivative is actually 0 here, but it is. If we differentiate this using the product rule, we get 2 times theta minus 1 squared plus 2 theta plus 1 times 2 theta minus 1, and we plug in theta equals 0, and uh, we wind up with exactly 0. So the graph of this thing is flat, goes down, and is flat down there. So that's going to be useful for just this piece. This guy, g theta, uh, g0, 1 of theta, is theta times theta minus 1 squared. So this is actually 0 at theta equals 0, because of that factor, 
and it's 0 at theta equals 1, and it's flat at theta equals 1. So derivative is 0 there. And the moment's consideration shows that the value of the derivative of this thing is 1. Okay, so it's kind of like the Lagrange property. Uh, you're going to be, these things are either going to be 1, or the derivative is going to be 1 at the place where we want this particular piece of information. Now, g10 is just like g00, except flipped around. So it's 0 here and flat here, and it's 1 here and it's flat here. And you have to, have to take the derivative and check and make sure that the value of the derivative at theta equals 1 is actually um, 0. But when we plug in theta equals 1 here, we get 1 times 3 minus 2, which is 1. So at least you can see directly that the, that the value of the function is, is 1 at that point. And this guy is just like this one, except negative, because theta is always less than 1. But its slope is positive at theta equals 1, and the values in, of the slope at theta equals 1 is exactly plus 1. And the value is flat and 0 at, at, at theta equals 0. So these four cubic polynomials are going to allow us to do cubic Hermite interpolation if we were given these four pieces of information. So now I've specified the interval 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to 1, but we want to be able to use these things on any interval. We want to be able to use these on an interval from tau n to tau n plus 1 in any possible uh, set of grid points. So we, what we do is we non-dimensionalize. We define theta to be x minus tau n divided by hn, where hn is the distance to the next tau. So tau n plus 1 is tau n plus hn, so hn is tau n plus 1 minus tau n. So when x equals tau n, theta equals 0, so that corresponds to the left end here. And when x equals tau n plus 1, we get tau n plus 1 minus tau n, which is hn, divided by hn, which is 1. So at the other end of the interval, uh, x equals tau n plus 1, we get theta equals 1. So this thing is non-dimensional, because x might be measured, for instance, in meters. And then the, dis the width of the intervals is also in meters, so you get meters over meters, which doesn't have dimension, so theta will be a pure number. Life is a little bit nicer if we deal with just pure numbers. So now I'm simply going to write down a polynomial of degree at most 3, which fits the data that f at tau n must be y n, and f prime at tau n plus 1 must be y n prime, and f at uh, tau n plus 1 must be y n plus 1, and f prime at tau n plus 1 must be y n plus 1. So it's just like the Lagrange case, we use our basic basis polynomials in each one. And the only difference is we have these this extra factor of hn popping out. And the reason that the extra factor of hn pops out is because of the chain rule. We have, when we take derivative with respect to x, which we want to do over here, well, taking derivative with respect to theta here is different. We have to use the chain rule. d by dx is d theta by dx, d by d theta. That's our standard chain rule. And d theta by dx is 1 over hn. And so when we differentiate with respect to uh, uh, x in here, we're going to get that extra factor of hn. And we need to have that because other, otherwise this is, this is going to mess us up. So you can see that this function here has pn of tau n is equal to yn. The derivative with respect to x of pn at x equals tau n is going to be yn prime. pn of tau n plus 1 is yn plus 1. And d by dx of uh, pn of x at x equals tau n plus 1 is going to be yn plus 1 prime. So if these are the four pieces of information we were given at the ends of a subinterval, this will tell us exactly what the cubic polynomial is that fits through there. This isn't a very human way of doing things. Humans um, won't want to deal with cubic polynomial in one subinterval and another cubic polynomial and another subinterval and another cubic polynomial and another subinterval and so on because the the accounting, the bookkeeping is just a little bit painful. 
but it's perfect for computers. This turns out to be easily programmed and easily uh, modified to fit a variety of circumstances, and it turns out to cure one of the main problems of uh, high degree polynomial interpolation. And the key is understanding this error polynomial here. And I'm going to give you an error formula. I'm going to actually just replace the, the Lagrange error pol polynomial error formula with uh, an error pol polynomial here. And we're just going to look at a graph of that polynomial theta squared times theta minus 1 squared. And I used my handy dandy HP 48 calculator uh, to work out a bunch of values of, of this polynomial on places. And we see that it has a maximum exactly in the middle, which you expect because it's like theta squared is like 1 minus theta squared, so you expect the maximum to be in the middle. And the maximum is exactly when theta equals 1 half, and the maximum is uh, 1 quarter times 1 quarter, so it's 1 16th or 0 0.0625, and it looks really nice. And in the next... Uh, section of the video, I'm going to explain how the, the factor of H uh, uh, um, interacts with this when we use theta equals uh, x minus tau n over h n, and we're going to see that the error is actually proportional to the width h to the power 4 divided by 16. So here, let's just do our little dynamic uh, drawing of the curve. finish the video. So we have the node polynomial is zero at either end and its derivative is zero at either end and that shows that the node polynomial does not affect. You can add a multiple of the node polynomial to this, this thing and it wouldn't change anything. And that's a bit of the story for the error. That's it for this particular video. We will move on to the next one.